Zachary Carabell, you have written this fascinating book all about how we live in a world defined by economic indicators and how just a handful of them, GDP, inflation, unemployment, have come to define us as a nation, even though, uh, as you make of the very good case, they are somewhat flawed and they are of limited value to a certain degree. How did we get to this point? I mean, start in the beginning. At the beginning of your book, you go all the way back to 1066 and William the Conqueror, and apparently our fascination with trying to measure where we stand in the world is very old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, so let me start for one moment What, why I wrote a book about numbers, right? Which I'm not a statistician. I'm, I'm not even a trained academic economist. I mean, I kind of have played one in my professional career. <laughs> but so I was interested in this question of how do we get to live in a world where these numbers are so woven into our identity and they're so woven into our conversation about how we're doing as a nation, any nation, not just we as Americans. And that I was, in fact, trained as an historian. So the question of, like, did, was this always the case? And no, it wasn't always the case. And it was, in fact, only the case really, really recently, given how central they were. So the question was, when did countries, when did people start to want to try to figure out what was going on economically with numbers? And I do start the book with 1066 uh, and William the Conqueror because the first major effort in the modern world I don't know if modern. 1066 is modern, <laughs> it is if you're a classicist, was the Domesday Book that William the Conqueror commissions to survey the output of his realm. Now, you probably could have gone back to the Romans because any empire from time immemorial basically wants to know how much land is under their control, mm -hmm. how many troops they can command, and how much farming output because the only real source of tax revenue is agriculture. So the Domesday Book really is just an effort to count Who's, who's farming what, with the glaring exception of not including the church, because the church wasn't under the authority of the king. And this actually previews a big theme of your book, is that even the Domesday Book had its flaws. Right. <laughs> I mean, you would think it would be pretty simple to go around your realm and write <laughs> down you know, how much corn or whatever crop was being grown. But even then, what, what it kind of shows is there's a big difference between counting and statistics. And there have been a lot of really good books about statistics. You know, statistics right. is the art of sampling a lot of stuff you count without having to count it all individually. But they didn't know that in 1066. They just tried to go around and count everything. Well, you bring up a really good, and that's what I wanted you to talk about, the birth of statistics, because it is very different from counting. Right. And, and you, you, you point out there's another big leap forward in terms of attempting to count stuff when we get to the age of empires and trade. And sort of suddenly now you have like global industry, and people are even more interested in who's making what goods and where they're headed to. But there does reach this point, and tell us when that is, when people realize the difference between between counting and statistics, what statistics do for you? Right. So, sometime in the sort of the age of enlightenment in the 17th century, people realized that one, most aspects of human reality are just too difficult to count, and the other thing is that if you go around and you count, like the first thing people realize, if you try to count um, average lifespan, mm -hmm. right, and particularly in a time when a lot of people didn't make it past five, six, right. seven years old. Mm -hmm. So if you were to count all infant mortality when trying to answer the question of average lifespan, your average lifespan would be unfortunately extraordinarily low. So that was one of the first efforts to go, look, to really get a snapshot in numbers of what's going on, you have to actually make choices about what to leave out and how to weight things. And then there's a whole series of mathematical formulas about how to really do that artfully, which develop in the 17th century in the same soup that creates the calculus and the same German and French world of of creating statistics. Who do we credit for this? I, mean, I don't. I mean, there's there there's Les Pairs, There's there's a whole number of people that if you're a statistician, you kind of remember as the great Here. minds in the way that we look at Newton um, in terms of calculus and, and gravity or Leibniz. But there isn't really one person who invents this. This is just a rolling series of mathematical evolutions. Um, but and it really takes until the 19th century before you start getting kind of the, the economic statistics that we think of now. Now, this book is obviously hugely focused on the United States. Right. And you make the case that, again, this question of counting was ever present even in the very beginning yeah. of the United States and very much on the mind of the founders and, in fact, makes its way into the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. and I think most people don't remember because it's not the most dramatic aspect of the Constitution. I mean, we talk about slavery. We talk about north-south and the balance of small states, weak states, minority rights, the whole Federalist Papers. We don't usually talk about that the census 
is embedded in the Constitution that every 10 years there be a count of the population. And this is because if you're going to have representational democracy, you have to know how many people you're representing, and you have to decide how many representatives in the House of Representatives, which is the one part of the government that is directly keyed to population, is going to represent. But it quickly moves in the 19th century from just how many people are there and where to, hmm, you know, the human curiosity to map and to measure. What are these people doing? Well, what's their employment? Uh, how many hours do they spend working? What's the nature of their, their home life in terms of output? And so you kind of begin this creeping growth of information about people's lives economically, even though it starts with just funding who, who's living where and how many. And so that gets us up to the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, where we begin to see the arrival of these modern indicators right. that now have come to define us so much. I think most people would be absolutely astounded. I mean, most people would be astounded by most things in this book because the history of this is all really interesting. But I think people would be really surprised to find out that the birth of a lot of these economic indicators was driven in a huge part by the kind of worries and political controversy, the cause of social justice that came along with the Industrial Revolution, labor unions, people worrying about how much people worked and how hard they worked right. and how much were they keeping. And you have the great story of Ethelbert Stewart. Tell us yeah. a little bit about him. So. Uh, if you'd asked many people in the 19th century about something called unemployment, it would have been a meaningless question because when you had a purely agrarian world where you just everybody needed to work to live, literally, the idea that you could be unemployed or without work was kind of inconceivable, particularly because until the population explodes in the late 19th century, there's almost always more things that need doing than there are bodies capable of doing it. So if you're not working, it's either because you're drunk or you have ill moral character or you're impaired somehow. And you didn't really have a job, right? right? You, 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 you had, had work, work that needed doing to be fed. So it took the Industrial Revolution and the, the sort of the transfer of, of workforces from the farms into factories to create this thing called a job. I mean, look, we're, being, we're painting with broad strokes here. I'm sure someone could find exceptions to these rules. And one of the things that drives the question of like, what's the nature of work, right? Do people have a job? Are they getting paid for that job adequately relative to their needs? Is the series of progressive reforms in the late 19th century that saw this kind of industrial revolution as also a really chaotic and dislocating one in the United States. And one of the people who is drawn to the, the, basically the cause of social justice a la the late 19th century is this guy named Ethelbert Stewart, who was trained as a coffin maker in Illinois and ends up being appointed to the, uh, the, the Illinois Commission of, of Labor and then makes his way to Washington where he joins what was then the very sleepy, not really well funded and only recently created Bureau of Labor Statistics. And Ethelbert Stewart, to picture him, he, I, I think of him as a little bit as, as if a statistician met Mark Twain, you know, ornery, uh, suffered fools not at all, and was a kind of, you know, I'm going to call a spade a spade and find the numbers to measure it kind of guy. And when he was one of these sort of driving forces of we need a snapshot of employment, the nature of employment patterns to prevent big business from taking it out of the unions. But he's also a, a man at, in the right time as right. well too, because you have this confluence of other factors. In particular, 1920, 1921, we have this recession. Yep. Uh, it sort of knocks people for a loop. Uh, you've got politicians saying, how can we even measure how bad it is when we don't know where we started from? And then of course you have the Great Depression. Right. Um, and this seems to push you know, very much this desire to count and understand uh, just what we're losing or how bad it is. Yeah, so, so a few things in this. The, you, people like Ethelbert Stewart had been around in the late 19th century. And people like Irving Fisher, who was a Yale professor, who was really interested in indices and sort of thinking about prices and what we now call inflation. So there had been some work done before the Great Depression on what's going on in this thing we now call the economy. And that too, by the way, there, nobody used the word the economy until the early 20th century. And the only reason why I can say that with any confidence is if you use something called Google's Ngram, which is everything printed, digitized in a Google database, and you can play around with it and find the frequency that which, which things were used. If you type in the words the economy into Google's Ngram, until about 1930, it flatlines. There's almost no mention of it. And then about 1930, it does this hockey stick and where it just keeps accelerating since then. Because until we create numbers, like the unemployment rate, like GDP, like inflation, 
There is no the economy. There's political economy. There's the output of state.